Come on guys, today we're gonna to have this conversation. The construction of the female savage. Women who are unfit for relationships. I'm going to explain to you how this happened in our society and I'm gonna to explain to you why it was intentionally done. So before we get into that, we need to get into the perspective of women in general. Women of, this started in the 60s. So let's go from the 1960s because there were still many submissive, agreeable, easy to get along women in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. In 2000, this is kind of when the shark jumped the ship or whatever that expression is. But going back previous to that, it was easy to find an agreeable, submissive woman. It was easy to find a girlfriend. It was easy to find a wife. There were many women that were qualified to be girlfriends and to be wives. Many of these female savages today are not qualified to be a girlfriend. They're not qualified to be a wife. And I'm going to explain why. So if we go back and look at history, also going back to my last video, the feminization of the American male, men were men, men were manly. So there was a lot of masculine, rough and rugged individual. There was so much masculine energy in America that these women could not help but be submissive. Now, let's go ahead and look at the construction of the female savage. And it started in the 60s with the black female. Listen to me and listen to me well. The black female was the beta testing for a widespread program. Let's call it the black bird project. And what they did is they pushed the black man out of the household. They gave this woman free health care, food stamps, a check and a place to live. So what do we know about women? Women move and gravitate toward hypergamy. So the hypergamy that was created by the government entity superseded what the average black man can do. Black men who, like A.G. Gaston, he didn't have these problems. Black men who were well off financially, they were able to find submissive, agreeable women. But also looking at what happened to the black community from slavery up to then, there were not a lot of black men who were in the position to be head of household. Even though we still had a robust manufacturing section, uh, sector, there was still racism. There was still things that were shut out for the average black man, not the exceptional black man, for the average black man. So the construction of this female savage, and now why is it important that it started with the black female? As someone who've dated a lot of white and Asian women, I have found a particularly interesting syndrome that a white woman who has a black female friend has a lot of admiration, awe, and respect for the single sassy black woman. I've heard it, it's almost like a certain level of reverence for their black female friends because they're so sassy, they're so strong, they're, they're such strong independent women. They'd have this attitude. This was the grooming of white women. Many white women not only stood on the, on the sidelines watching the black woman operate, many of the white women adapted black woman attributes. And this was the grooming of the white woman. And even to this day, even if you have a white woman who's still very much a white woman in behavior and attributes, there's a level of super respect for that single strong black woman. So this once again, groom the white female community for the place to become savages. Now, why are these savages unfit to be girlfriends and they're unfit to be wives? Part of the problem is the ideology. And this is what I call the stripper syndrome. Once a woman becomes a stripper, it becomes very hard for her to have a conventional relationship because she sees men as ATMs. They come in, they put money in her G-string. So it becomes very hard for a woman who's a stripper, a woman who's a prostitute, a woman who's a porn star to actually enter into conventional relationships. 
They can enter into alternative relationships, a porn star marrying a porn star that works, uh, escort marrying a uh, male escort that works, a stripper being with a, a male stripper that works. I will tell you a story. I wouldn't consider this guy a friend. I would consider him an acquaintance. And this is a guy that I met and he was a male stripper. Let me give you what he looked like. He was 6'5", about 250, extremely muscular, and he had an extremely big dick. He can like swing it around. Like I saw videos and I would listen to his stories because he would come in and he would do these parties and he would literally have women suck his dick, uh, masturbate. And he had one woman who just backed that pussy up on his hard dick during the show. And he just went with it. So when women are in that environment where it's just women, their true nature comes out. And he actually had a relationship with a female stripper and she was extremely attractive and it worked because one night he was telling me he went home after he got like he was doing a show and he had some of these big girls and these big girls just pushed him down and they just all started sucking his dick so he goes home he tells his girlfriend what happens and she said you think that's something let me tell you I had this dude, he put his fingers in my pussy. And they had this conversation, this work-related conversation that would have been extremely strange and odd for anyone else. But to them, because it came with the territory of being strippers, they were able to communicate, they were able to talk, they were able to share, they were able to build a relationship, an alternative relationship. So typically, what's going on, guys? You only have, today is the 24th, You've only got six more days to get into intellectual property school where we're going to have a lot of fun. And I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm doing a group. There will be a group. Uh, the group is already exist. Is, the group is already made. It's not a lot going on in the group because we're going to start that in July with the uh, projects and tasks. But I'm going to tell you why you want to get into intellectual property school today. First of all, you get home economics. And let me have this conversation with you. Everybody wants to make money and because they feel if I make more money, it's going to solve their problems. That is untrue. For you to solve your problems, you must attack your problems right now where you are. And for you, before you start making more money, you need to learn how to manage the money that you already make to the best of your ability. And that's what home economics will do. And there's home economics, there's script your days, and there's the beginning of how to create an offer. Now, I'm gonna, you know, at the risk of turning a lot of you off because you're not gonna make money instantly with intellectual property school. You're not. You're looking at a six to 12 month journey. But here's the thing. Once you build it, it's very hard to take apart. Like, I wouldn't make money from this channel if I stopped posting videos for about six months. So what you do is you build in a, re a reservoir of income and money because once again, intellectual property is not some quick, easy hustle. But I'm going to share something with you, and many of you may think I'm bragging, and I'm not telling this to impress you. I'm telling this to impress upon you. The other day, I put down my deposit for my 2022 911 Turbo S convertible. It's going to be the first new, new car that I have had in years, because typically I buy used. And this is possible because of intellectual property. I am gonna have a $270,000 car and I'm gonna be able to pay cash for it because it was, the uh, deposit was like 10% because it's 250. With tax, it's gonna be probably like 270. And let me tell you something else that I'm getting ready to do. I have a chunk of money that came from previous intellectual property properties, right? And that's kind of like my attitude money. That's like, I, I don't touch it. So what I'm gonna do with Intellectual Property School, and you will see me do this because I'm gonna talk about how I'm gonna do it in the school. I'm gonna create enough money to buy a million dollar house from this project. I'm not gonna touch my attitude money. I'm gonna create new income because this is what I do. Instead of touching my money that's just sitting there, I create new income. And you're going to see me within the next 
12 to 24 months, buy a house and pay cash. Cause see, I'm not one of those fake YouTubers who is financing everything and then trying to tell you that I make more money than I really do. I'm gonna show you and it's gonna be part of the curriculum and I may keep this place because this is this could become the office. This could become a just it'll just be a, another write off. So you will see that you will see the whole process because I'm going to break down to you how to start a YouTube channel, a very small YouTube channel and make five to fifteen thousand dollars within six to twelve months. I'm going to show you that. But once again, you got to get in today because I know many of you are going to wait to the 30th when the offer expires because that's human nature. Like last night, uh, I put in an offer to previous students and literally had 50 people pile in yesterday, even though I've been running this offer for a minute. So once again, you want to get into intellectual property school because intellectual property school is not a quick hustle, but I've been doing this since 2009. I've been making money from intellectual property since October of 2009. It's 2022 and in 2023, and this is something else too. Uh, I'm going to do a video on the corporate finance. Like I have no intentions of retiring. You want to know why? Let me share something with you. I don't work 40 hour weeks. Now that I'm doing the project, it's ranched it up to 30. Typically when I'm not doing the project, I work maybe 10 hours a week. My life has been like that for years. So once you get, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time building it. Yeah. You know, two, three years building it. But once you build it, you can ease into a moderate schedule and make a lot of money. This month, I haven't tracked my hours, but I have probably worked because there was the Art of uh, Profit podcast I was working on. So this month, I have worked the most that I've worked this year, this month. And I know I have not worked 160 hours. I know I haven't. Like yesterday, you know what I did? I got both my cars waxed. I wrote an email. And this is the thing with intellectual property. It creates time and freedom flexibility where you can do stuff and you don't have to be tied to anything. Because if there's one thing I can teach you about intellectual property, is you can do something one time and get paid from it over and over and over and over. I wrote Making Money A to Z with self storage unit auctions and I got paid from that book for five years. Five years. I was getting orders and this is funny, for the longest time, most of my orders happened between 11 and 3 p.m. and 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. in the morning. So what this has done is created a situation where I don't have passive income. I'm not going to even lie to you like that, but I have not passive. That's the wrong. I have income. I have effortless income. That's what I have. I don't have passive income because I have to work. I have to maintain the YouTube channels, but I have effortless income because uh, I will tell you, I'm not bragging. I, I want to impress upon you. Last night I made $80,000 in less than 24 hours. And this is the power of intellectual property. Will you make that kind of money out the gate? Absolutely not. But if you stick with it, because I didn't make that kind of money right out the gate. My first year, I only made $62,000. My second year, I made 92. And then once I started to put some head and shoulders on my stuff, then I made 1.5 million. Even with all my business knowledge, it still took me three years. So you're not going to make the kind of money I'm making. But once again, you will make life changing money because Statistically, 81% of you only make $35,000 a year. So if you go to five to $15,000, let's just say you start making $5,000. Once again, $5,000 a month is $60,000 a year and you keep your job. You're, you're close to 100 Gs a year. You're close to 100 Gs a year. That's life changing money. So go below, enroll in intellectual property school today and get started working on your future today. When you have people who are strippers, escorts and porn stars, it is very, very hard, practically impossible for them to have a conventional relationship because of what they do. And this is what has set the tone. There are many young women who want to be a stripper, a prostitute 
are a sugar baby. They do not want to be a girlfriend or a wife. In the 60s and 70s, it was a girl's wish to grow up and get married and become a mother. Now it's a girl's wish to become an Instagram baddie, to become a uh, OnlyFans girl, or to become a prostitute or to be a stripper. Like, go ahead here on YouTube and look at the, there's a Christina Villalagres. And there's a number of YouTube channels put up by female strippers. And this is something I found to be really interesting. Once Christina Villalagres, uh, her channel makes so much money and she has so much affiliate money, she's actually stopped stripping. And I've seen this over and over again, that once their YouTube channel gets to a certain level and the money gets to a certain level, they stop stripping. And I'm gonna tell you why. And this is what I call the sugar baby syndrome. There are many women who are rushing to these sites to become sugar babies, but at their core, they know what they're signing up for and they refuse to accept the truth and reality. When you want to be a someone's sugar baby, you want to be someone's employee. You want to be a dedicated prostitute. And many of them, they, they go ahead and say, I'm a sugar baby. And this is why this mythology of being a sugar baby without doing anything, just going out and getting paid to go to dinners and stuff. And it does happen. But in most cases, the man who's dropping that money, he wants to have sex. And if he ain't having sex, he's not dropping that money. So they've created this fantasy that is peddled on YouTube and TikTok that you can be a sugar baby and you don't have to do anything. And one of the things that I've seen during my experiments is they don't want to confront that reality that they're actually a sex worker. Even though they're flocking to OnlyFans for sex workers, chatter beta sex workers. So we're having a proliferation of women move to these categories and once they enter, become a stripper, an OnlyFans girl, a sugar baby, it becomes practically impossible for them to have a conventional relationship. So from a social standpoint with the global reset, with what we have with the global reset and what we have with the new world order, life is getting very hard for the unskilled. And this is a big, big problem. And I always tell my people, if you're having a money problem, it's not that you're, you, it's not you have a income problem, you have a skill set problems. You do not have the appropriate skill sets. I know someone, a friend, a son of a friend of mine, who's coming out of college this year with a computer science degree and a minor in cybersecurity, and he's been offered 10 jobs that pay $150,000 to $180,000 right out of college. So the money is there if you have the right skill sets. And historically, women have gotten soft degrees, not hard degrees. And there was a interesting thing. I was watching this woman who, she has a chess stream and a chess YouTube channel, and she makes a lot of money from playing chess. And she was talking about the challenges, because she's attractive, the challenges that she faces as being a female chess player. And here's the thing, chess, computer science, engineering, medical school, law school, these things are, have always been available to women, but women don't want to do these things because they're very, very hard very very hard so it isn't that the women aren't welcome in these spaces it's just that the average woman doesn't want to dedicate the intellectual rigor to position herself and to qualify herself for these careers and once again with all of this stuff going on with a number like when i was doing my sugar baby research i was shocked to see 65 year old women on the website so from 18 to 65, you have women who are trying to qualify as a sex worker. Now, once again, this is why these women are not qualified to be girlfriends. They're not qualified to be um, wives. Because when you go ahead and get into those mores, you change as a person. I will share a story with you with a relationship that I had with someone off of the Sugar Baby website. It's happened quite a few times. And we were talking and she was supposed to meet someone else and he flaked on her. So I invited her out to dinner. So we go to dinner, we have fun, there's connection, 
We go back to my place. We have sex. She never asked me for money because once again, most women who are on these websites don't want to be that girl. So we actually saw each other for two years. She got spanked and all this other stuff. So because of that mindset that, yes, I want money, but I don't want to be a hoe. I don't want to be a hoe. And that's how I've been able to pull women off the website and create relationships with them because the average woman, and this is what happens when the average woman is confronted with the reality, she makes a choice. And typically they'll cycle on the website. And once they realization, if they're average and normal and they're still fit to be a girlfriend or a wife, they will come off the website. But the women who are on that website, and this is one of the things that you got to be careful of is a woman to go on that website and she would have three or four or five sugar daddies and she'll be having sex with all of them. And that is one of the things that I found because uh, I would like establish something yet they would still be on the site. And I actually emailed one and I said, well, I thought we were supposed to meet. And she says, you never know because we haven't met yet. So I want to keep my options open. And I saw this over and over and over again that even when they had quote, a verbal agreement, they would still stay on that website and they would keep looking. And this is the epitome of the female savage because once they enter into sex work, once they get used to dealing with multiple men, they become unfit to become a girlfriend. They become unfit to become a wife because this destroys the pair bonding, you know, and this is something that's spoken a lot about in the manosphere. And it's true when a woman experiences like a woman that has like 15 relationships where she has sex with 15 men and they're her boyfriend, her pair bonding is fine because she knows how to attach. She knows how to be with people. But based upon these women going into porn and I, I'm going to submit to you this and put this in the comments. Have you noticed that the porn industry doesn't have a problem getting new, young, beautiful women? There's no problem with them getting these women. None. There is no shortage of women who want to go on camera and have sex for money. There's no shortage. Because this is something else I call to the drug dealer. Like, many drug dealers have beautiful girlfriends, and the girlfriends know what they do. They don't care. There are no Florida Evans um, type mentality. Florida Evans was very stand up, straightforward, and she would not be with a man who was committing crime because once JJ got into selling drugs and Florida lost her mess on JJ. But with the creation of the female savage, and once again, this was intentionally done. This did not happen by accident because once the female, the black female established through hypergamy that she can get not all her needs met, but a good many of her needs met shelter, food, some cash, health care, that hypergamy took over. So we're in a situation right now where you're dealing with these female savages who are operating on hyper hypergamy. And that song that by Janet Jackson, what have you done for me lately is very true and resonates in that today's society. So instead of these women growing up to be wives and girlfriends and wanting to be a mother, they want to be a prostitute. They want to be an Instagram star. They want to be a YouTube star. They want to be OnlyFans. And this has disrupted the whole dating and mating environment because these women are unfit to be girlfriends and they're unfit to be wives because you can't trust them. Once again, I saw on the Sugar Baby website, over and over and over again, because, you know, they, they cannot because it's like they're addicted to the attention. And once again, the girls that I entered into relationships with, once we entered into a relationship, they came off the website. Boom. Instantly. So it's, it's kind of odd that we're having this conversation because with the construction of the female savage, it started in the black community. And it became a situation that spread wholesale through society. Because right now, someone had put up 
uh, I pulled up a video on B School for Hustlers talking about the the uh, facade of the young rich person. There are young rich people. There are people in the NFL. There are NBA players. There's rappers. There are very young and extremely rich people. But typically, the average age of the average millionaire in America is 62. So the bulk of rich people are old. And she put up there, you know. Bad Barbie, and this is the girl that was on the Dr. Phil show, Catch Me Outside, she put up on OnlyFans, and like, I didn't spend the money, because, like, to me, Bad Barbie looks like a little girl. I mean, she, she has a little body, she's, she, to me, she's not, she's a pretty girl from the face, but from the body, she doesn't have what I like, so, I wasn't going to drop $23 to see what she looked like on her OnlyFans. And, you know, the, the conversation went like, Bad Barbie proved that your assumptions are wrong. And once again, this is someone who wanted to use an exception because Bad Barbie had something that this chick didn't have. Name, brand, recognition because she was on the Dr. Phil show. Everyone in the world knew who she was because of the act that she put on on the Dr. Phil show. So she has been in the public domain since she's been 13 and she's like 1920 now. So her whole um, maturing life, she's been in the public domain and she has a Twitter, uh, Instagram following of like 16 million followers. And once again, if you're a girl on Instagram and you have a million or so followers, you can pop over to OnlyFans. And here's the thing that is funny, and this kind of goes back to the feminization of the American male. You don't have to take your clothes off to get money out of these men. Let me say this again. If you already have an internet following, you can go to OnlyFans and post literally the same pictures that you post on your Instagram account, on your OnlyFans account, and get paid. Because these men are so thirsty that they will pay to see a picture that they could see for free on your Instagram because they're so thirsty. And part of this is what happened to the black man um, is not something that the black man can control. What happened to the black man in the 60s was not in something that he can control. This was the era of the civil rights movement. This was the era of Jim Crow. And there was real racism. Racism. I often say that your grandfather and your father dealt with a level of racism that we simply don't deal with. And it was very much evident back then. And with this construction of the female savage that we have, as a man, you have got to be uber careful because even when I was running the Craigslist protocols, I would run into these female savages. And this is how I created my sorting mechanism. Because typically, a female savage, I remember I met this one girl and we actually played and then she turned around and she comes over the next time and she comes over with a strap on dildo and she said, well, you dominated me. Now it's my turn to dominate you. And I was like, time out. That's not going to happen. You're not. You're not using that on me. That's not, she said, but it's only fair. You did all that to me. It was fun. Maybe you would enjoy being dominated by a woman. And I was like, it ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. And this is one of the things that I have consistently seen that I can tell when a woman is truly submissive, give you, give you an idea. Like with my girls, I like to pick their nail color. And if you're dealing with a truly submissive woman, whatever color you say, okay, boom, they'll do it. There's no conversation, there's no, switch, no pushback, next time you see them. But if you have to have a conversation where she likes a certain nail color, because what she's telling you is, I don't want to please you. I want to please me. And this is the signs that you're dealing with a female savage. You know, and savages come in categories. There's the hardcore savage, which are women who are just talking around, who literally enjoy making men feel bad. They 
the, that's the that's that's that, that's DEFCON four, and then you know you got DEFCON one where they're just a little disagreeable, but once again that disagreeable because it's been scientifically proven and studied that conflict resolution, how well a couple handles conflict resolution is a signal to how long that relationship will last. And when you're dealing with DEFCON 1 and the female favish, they're problematic and they're, they're difficult to deal with. They're not as full-fledged as DEFCON 4, but in terms of having a long-term relationship, it can be very hard to have a relationship with them because they're so disagreeable to even the littlest things. Because I will share with you my protocols because it got to the point where I would put a woman through what I like to call the phase, the test. First thing I would ask for her to send me pictures of her on her knees, butt naked. Do it pass. Then I would get her to do pictures. I would get her to masturbate at work. And by the time that I would give her 30, maybe 40 tasks, if she does them without problems, when she's before me, she's really gonna perform. But if I start getting pushback, I never met with them because I was dealing with a female savage. I was dealing with someone who was disagreeable. They were kind of interested in kinky stuff, but they were not my level of submissive. And my level of submissive is, I tell you to do something, you do it. That's what I deal with. That's what I've been dealing with for the last 20 years. So I'm not accustomed to having, you know, like I like my girls to wear heels. Uh, some women, well, I can't wear heels because my foot hurt or there's a problem. Once again, you're dealing with a female savage. I will tell you a story where I was dealing with a savage and her savagery came out later because the first few times that we played, she was submissive. She did what I wanted. Then this chick had a full meltdown on me because I wanted head and she's like, I don't feel like sucking a dick. And then she actually got mad and she w took an Uber and went home. And I begin to understand why this chick wasn't in a relationship. She had six kids and I did not know that until later. And then to this day, she still messages me and she's like, I'm really sorry for the way that I behaved. And I'm like, I am not messing with you no more. I am done with you because you are not orientated because you have mental issues, you have stress, you have struggle, you have a lot of stuff going on where you're unfit at a minimum to be a girlfriend because of so much of the stuff that you've got going on. And when you're dealing with these female savages, you have to recognize that they have a very high level of disagreeability. Like, prime example, if you see a girl and she has not one or two, like, you know, I'm not a big fan of tattoos, but like if a girl has one or two tattoos and like a little tattoo or something like that, maybe a tramp stamp, that's not a big concern. But when you see a girl that has multiple tattoos, I mean multiple tattoos, I'm talking seven, eight, nine, ten, that usually is a sign of high disagreeability because having that many tattoos is I don't really care what anyone thinks of me. I'm gonna do what I want to do. And I, I had someone who was extremely, and this, this is another situation. When we're together, she was extremely submissive. She would do whatever I wanted. And then she started making money. And then she started becoming disagreeable. And she started to flake on me because she was making money, because the money presented options. And this is what's funny. We were having a conversation a few months ago, and right now she's lonely. She can't figure out why she can't find anyone else. And I set the template. I paid all the bills, so she was able to do whatever she wanted with her money. I will never, ever do that again. And I will explain why. If I have a woman living with me, because I don't need a woman to help me pay bills. I don't need that. What we're going to do, and I'm gonna have a conversation with her. I'm gonna say, look, so you should easily be able to put 50 in. And it was always a problem. It's like I got credit cards, it was always an issue. So if a woman moves in with me again, I'm gonna like, look, 
what you need to do is establish a separate account and put what you would have been paying for rent in that account. Keep her accountable, keep her, you know, situated because what will happen is as we move forward, that money will go towards investments. So she did multiple tattoos, smoking weed, got a little mouth, very sassy, very distasteful to me, very distasteful to me. And typically, because of the way that I was raised, I had a stay at home mother in my grandmother. And a lot of people didn't get that. So when we look at backgrounds, even though it was a alternative to parent household, my mother acted as my father and my grandmother acted as my mother. So I was raised that way until 11 when my grandmother died. So I facilitate and resonate very well with people with similar backgrounds, because that's what it is. I never had a friend that was killed in high school. Um, until my last year, we didn't even have pregnant girls in my school. So I grew up in a somewhat wholesome environment. And my first girlfriend in life was a redhead, green eyed white girl in eighth grade, Rebecca Gross. So that's how I get down. And you, for you, you, Umar, John, oh, Umar Johnson advocates, like, you know, they ain't nothing for a black man but a black woman. I would heartily disagree. I believe you should be with whoever fits into because Once again, this is how I was set up by having a two parent household. That's how I was set up. So I cannot like, oh, my God, I was dealing with this glorified hood rat who was a teacher. And because she grew up in that environment, we just constantly bumped heads, bumped heads, bumped heads, bumped heads. She liked my masculinity. She liked the way that I sexed her down. But from life experience, that was just bumping heads, just bumping heads, just bumping heads. Because she couldn't get the fact, because I would tell her to go to work and network with her coworkers. She didn't want to do it because she, she was a female savage. And to this day, she is alone. And one of the things that female savages, they, they'll, they'll say these words. I want a relationship. I want someone to be there for me. However, due to the construction of the female savage and due to the pathology that was created in the 60s, they do not have relationship skills. I'm going to tell you something with my girlfriend. And this has happened to me several times because I'm thinking about doing a masculinity course to help men create true masculinity. My girlfriend, and that's who she is. She's coming here, she's rearranged stuff, she's organized stuff, she's cleaned up stuff. And there was another chick I was seeing before her. She she threw all her shit away. <laughs> she threw all her, she found all that stuff. Because the other chick had a toothbrush here, some earrings, and some other stuff. And I went into the trash and I saw some stuff that was in the shower in the trash. And she's like, she's not welcome here anymore. And it is highly amusing because this has happened to me many, many times. And once again, um, <laughs> it's so funny that she has identified that I want to be here. Number one, this is something else. I want to be here. Number two. I will be useful to you. She's very, very useful, extremely useful, extremely helpful, extremely submissive. So she has relationship building skills. She came in and we, we never had a conversation, washed all my clothes, rearranged my closet. She's already acting like a wife. And this is one of the things that the female savage will tell you. I am not acting like a wife without a ring on my finger. Do not believe the hype. If a woman tells you that, run, because she's a female savage. Here's the thing, and I'm here to tell you from personal experience. If you're going to enter into a long-term relationship with a woman, if you do not see her exhibiting signs of acting like a wife early, she never will do it. 
because she doesn't have relationship skills. My girlfriend, mother and father are married and her grandpa. So she has seen that dynamic. But once again, like I chuckle because she threw all that other chick shit away. <laughs> it was just like, she's like, I have entered the room. I am here. She is gone. And, you know, I just chuckled because I wasn't mad. I wasn't upset because I came to that same decision weeks ago. And one of the things that you will understand when a woman wants to be with you, she will make it known. She will make it clear. She will make it plain. There ain't no chasing. There's no bigger will. There's no uh, ambiguity. There's no guesswork. You will know and feel that she likes you. But if you have been with a woman for six months and you really don't know where you stand, you're dealing with a female savage because a submissive woman that has the attributes and the skills to have a relationship will let you know quite early. And they will like, they will claim you. They will like, you my man, you my man. They will tell you very early. They will not have to wait because once again, dealing with, you know, if you're dealing with a deaf come one female savage, she can fool you and you could kind of be in some kind of quasi relationship and deaf um, that you don't have to worry about being in a relationship with deaf come for because it's going to be so inhospitable and nasty in her behavior that you, you're just not going to do that. But once again, a woman who wants to be in a relationship with you will be useful to you in whatever capacity she can. Whatever capacity she can, she will be useful and helpful to you. Whether it's like cooking dinner. I remember years ago, and this is how it would be. You would take a girl out and you would treat her well and she would invite you over for a home-cooked meal. Female savages can't cook! Or she would invite you to the barbecue. You know, she would reciprocate in some kind of manner fairly quickly. Female savages, they want to be catered to and they want to be spoiled. They want to be uh, worshipped. They want to be pampered because they're looking for daddy. The daddy they never had. Even if there was a man in the house who was a strong, who was a weak man, they never had a strong um, daddy. I'm going to tell you something I saw the other day, and I thought it was extremely positive. This man married this woman, and he adopted her daughter. Now, once again, MGTOW, Red Pill Men, are throwing stuff at the screen. And this girl and this man had developed a bond. And when he announced to her that he adopted her, she just broke down because here's the thing. Every child wants to be wanted. It is a natural desire to want to be wanted, to be loved, to be cherished, to be taken care of. This is a natural, normal set of feelings. And this little girl just broke down because this she's like, this man wants to be my daddy. And this is what many of these female savages don't have. They don't have a daddy. They never had a daddy figure. So they're looking for you to be their daddy, i.e. give me money with no expectation of anything, like daddy, your daddy. You can walk in the room. Hey dad, I'm going to the pizza shop. I need 20 bucks. Okay, here you go. Here you go, little girl. That's what they want because they never had it. They never had it. They're looking for daddy. They're not looking for a relationship. They're looking for daddy, da, 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 daddy. And that is one of the biggest reasons that these women are unfit for to be girlfriends and they're unfit for marriage because they're still trying to heal from the wounds of their childhood of not having a strong, stable father figure. I'm gonna share some with you. When I was a kid, I never moved. I lived in the same house until I left Alabama to join the military. I never moved. My childhood was extremely stable. In many regards, it was boring because nothing really happened. Nothing bad happened. You know, some good things would happen, but it was extremely stable. I grew up 
with day after day, month after month, year after being the same. So this created this level of security in me that many men and women simply don't have today because their childhood was complete and other hell. So this is many of the reasons that you cannot have a relationship with the female savage. Now, unless the female savage recognizes that she's a savage, that she has a problem and she goes to get therapy and counseling, because at some point, some of these female savages can be rescued, but you cannot rescue them. They have to climb out the pit of their own. They have to climb out the pit, get to the top and get a therapist. And at that point, if they're in therapy and they're working on themselves, you can kind of work with them. But as long as they're straight up savage, like I'm fine, worship me, adore me, give me money for doing nothing. There ain't nothing you can do with them. There ain't nothing you can do with them. And this is part of, and how does this impact the economy? Once again, uh, this is the Institute of Economic Thought. This impacts the economy because you have all of these women who are on the verge of becoming sex workers. And the more money that these women have, the more money that they're gonna spend. So in some regards, and it's really diabolical, but when you look at what the New World Order has done, they have created these female savages, these sex workers who will make money and spend more money and propel the economy. It's really, really diabolical because from a purely economic standpoint, having these women make money is good for the economy because they're going to spend it. They're going to stimulate the economy. But one of the big issues with these women and this money is once they get used to making their own money, they become untenable. They become very hard to deal with because like, once again, I just told you my plan. The next woman that I live with, there's going to be a plan. We're going to have a conversation and she's going to do it or she ain't moving in. And uh, you cannot have this because they're very disagreeable and being hotly disagreeable is a sure sign that you will not have a long and loving relationship. Being highly disagreeable. It's just not going to work because I, as a dominant masculine man, have had many relationships where I literally say, I want you to do this. And it's like, OK, no pushback, no conversation. That's how that's what I'm accustomed to. I'm not accustomed to negotiation. And like one of the reasons the chick that got fired, she's submissive, but she's a little disagreeable. She's got some DEFCON 1 female savage in her. And that's one of the reasons she got fired. She got dumped. She got fired because I had a better option. And once again, and I told her, you know, because, um, you know, relationships that are built on lies are not really good relationships. And I told her that was someone I was seeing and we were supposed to see each other this Sunday, but I actually changed it and I wanted to see you. And that's how our relationship has been built on honesty. Cause like, you know, she knew she was here. She saw the girl stuff that she, she threw in the trash. <laughs> She's like, Hey, Hey, get out of here. Get out of here. I'm coming in. And this is one of the things that you will understand. You're here a woman that I will not compete for a man, a submissive woman who wants you will compete for you. I've been in this situation several times where women were like, tell you once again, I was dealing with this woman and uh, she was my submissive. And I told her, you know, one day we were messing around. I said, you're number three. And she said, I'm what? I said, you're number three. I'm seeing three women and you're number three. You're the one I see the least. And then without missing a beat, she says, what do I need to do to become number one? Once again, what do I need to do to become number one? Women, when they want you, will compete for you. They will not sweat another woman. They're like, once again, this like, I'm gonna tell you something. A lot of people are gonna disagree with me in the comments. If you have a woman that you're treating well and you go out and get some strange pussy, if her first thing is I'm leaving, you have married a female savage. A woman who cares and loves for you will fight for you. She will fight for you. I had a friend who
who was dealing with his wife and they were having problems. And he went out and he started an affair. And his wife pretty much knew when the affair started because a lot of his behavior has changed. Because that's the first clue, your behavior changes. And then she one day, she uh, calls him at work. She says, when you come home, we need to talk. So he comes home, she's in the living room, she's on the couch. And this is what this woman did because she was not a female savage. He sat down, then she got on her knees and she took his hands and she said, please don't leave me. I know that you have been unhappy. I know that you're seeing another woman. I can deal with that. We need to work on our marriage. I don't want a divorce. I want to be with you. And they worked it on out. But, but the female savage, she can't do nothing like that. She cannot do like that. She cannot re recognize her own inadequacies and deficiencies. Like, you get some, I'm by, divorce court, child support. This is why these women are not worth making girlfriends and wives. Because they're not in it for the long haul. They're not in, they're in it for the minute. They're in it for what you can do for them. Now, the women out there, and there's a lot of good, submissive, agreeable women out there. There's tons of them. There's tons of them. But once again, you get caught up in the female savage because I'm going to say it. I got a video on disrupting male. Crazy women have some of the best trim on the planet. I don't know what it is. I've experienced it. My uh, ex top, top three. And what's funny is I'm wondering what is the level of craziness of my current girlfriend because it's there. I'm, I'm an adult. I'm aware because the sex is amazing. And I'm like, normally when you get this level of sex, you get some craziness. And I'm going to say something that may seem extremely dismissive. All women are crazy. It's just a matter of degree. And so far, I've not seen anything I cannot deal with. But time, you know, we're, we're you know, because we've been very honest. She shared a lot of stuff with me, a lot of bad stuff. And, you know, I've shared a lot of stuff with her. And, you know, this is what we're, we're building this. So I don't think anything too crazy is going to pop up because of the way that she is. But, you know, there's a possibility. And this is why we have what we have. The New World Order uses government agents to infiltrate the federal government to create all of these programs that were highly unfair to men and to liberate the woman from being part of a traditional relationship. What's going on, guys? You only have, the day is the 24th. You've only got six more days to get into intellectual property school where we're going to have a lot of fun. And I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm doing a group. There will be a group. Uh, the group is already exist is the group is already made. It's not a lot going on in the group because we're going to start that in July with the uh, projects and tasks. But I'm going to tell you why you want to get into intellectual property school today. First of all, you get home economics. And let me have this conversation with you. Everybody wants to make money and because they feel if I make more money, it's going to solve their problems. That is untrue. For you to solve your problems, you must attack your problems right now where you are. And for you, before you start making more money, you need to learn how to manage the money that you already make to the best of your ability. And that's what home economics will do. And there's home economics, there's script your days, and there's the beginning of how to create an offer. Now, I'm gonna, you know, at the risk of turning a lot of you off because you're not gonna make money instantly with intellectual property school. You're not. You're looking at a six to 12 month journey. But here's the thing. Once you build it, it's very hard to take apart. Like I wouldn't make money from this channel if I stopped posting videos for about six months. So what you do is you build in the, a reservoir of income and money because once again, intellectual property is not some quick, easy hustle, but I'm going to share something with you. And many of you may think I'm bragging and I'm not telling this to impress you. I'm telling this to impress upon you. The other day I put down my deposit for my 2022 911 Turbo S convertible. It's going to be the first new, new car 
that I have had in years because typically I buy used. And this is possible because of intellectual property. I am going to have a $270,000 car and I'm going to be able to pay cash for it because it was a uh, deposit was like 10% because it's 250 with tax. It's going to be probably like 270. And let me tell you something else that I'm getting ready to do. I have a chunk of money that came from previous intellectual property properties, right? And that's kind of like my attitude money. That's like, I, I don't touch it. So what I'm going to do with intellectual property school, and you will see me do this because I'm going to talk about how I'm going to do it in the school. I'm going to create enough money to buy a million dollar house from this project. I'm not going to touch my attitude money. I'm going to create new income because this is what I do. Instead of touching my money that's just sitting there, I create new income. And you're going to see me within the next 12 to 24 months buy a house and pay cash. Because see, I'm not one of those fake YouTubers who is financing everything and then trying to tell you that I make more money than I really do. I'm going to show you and it's going to be part of the curriculum and I may keep this place because this is this could become the office. This will become just it'll just be a, another write off. So you will see that you will see the whole process because I'm going to break down to you how to start a YouTube channel, a very small YouTube channel and make five to fifteen thousand dollars within six to twelve months. I'm going to show you that. But once again, you got to get in today because I know many of you are going to wait to the 30th when the offer expires because that's human nature. Like last night, uh, I put in an offer to previous students and literally had 50 people pile in yesterday, even though I've been running this offer for a minute. So once again, you want to get into intellectual property school because intellectual property school is not a quick hustle, but I've been doing this since 2009. I've been making money from intellectual property since October of 2009. It's, 2000, it's 2022. And in 2023, and this is something else too. Uh, I'm going to do a video on the corporate finance. Like, I have no intentions of retiring. You want to know why? Let me share something with you. I don't work 40 hour weeks. Now that I'm doing the project, it's ranched up to 30. Typically, when I'm not doing the project, I work maybe 10 hours a week. My life has been like that for years. So once you get, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time building it. Yeah. You know, two, three years building it. But once you build it, you can ease into a moderate schedule and make a lot of money. This month, I haven't tracked my hours, but I have probably worked because there was the Art of uh, Profit podcast I was working on. So this month, I have worked the most that I've worked this year, this month. And I know I have not worked 160 hours. I know I haven't. Like yesterday, you know what I did? I got both my cars waxed. I wrote an email. And this is the thing with intellectual property. It creates time and freedom flexibility where you can do stuff and you don't have to be tied to anything. Because if there's one thing I can teach you about intellectual property is you can do something one time and get paid from it over and over and over and over. I wrote Making Money A to Z with Self Storage Unit Auctions and I got paid from that book for five years. Five years. I was giving orders and this is funny for the longest time. Most of my orders happened between 11 and 3 p.m. and 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. in the morning. So what this has done is create a situation where I don't have passive income. I'm not going to even lie to you like that, but I have not passive. That's the wrong. I have income. I have effortless income. That's what I have. I don't have passive income because I have to work. I have to maintain the YouTube channels, but I have effortless income because uh, I will tell you, I'm not bragging. I, I want to impress upon you. Last night, I made $80,000 in less than 24 hours. And this is the power of intellectual property. Will you make that kind of money out the gate? Absolutely not. But if you stick with it, because I didn't make that kind of money right out the gate. My first year, I only made $62,000. 
My second year, I made 92. And then once I started to put some head and shoulders on my stuff, then I made 1.5 million. Even with all my business knowledge, it still took me three years. So you're not gonna make the kind of money I'm making, but once again, you will make life-changing money because statistically, 81% of you only make $35,000 a year. So if you go to five to $15,000, let's just say you start making $5,000. Once again, $5,000 a month is $60,000 a year and you keep your job. You're, you're close to 100 Gs a year. You're close to 100 Gs a year. That's life-changing money. So go below, enroll in intellectual property school today and get started working on your future today.